every day I'm like, what did I do today that's going to matter tomorrow? And if you've got something that you can say, yeah, that's going to matter. Particularly if you don't have children, you can't see the legacy as clearly as if you have children. And so that was extremely helpful to me. That was Nancy Van Rees. She's the Nashville and Davidson County Metro Council member responsible for surging popularity and citizen activism in District 8, which includes parts of North Englewood, Maplewood, and Madison. In 2015, Nancy was the first openly out lesbian elected to a legislative body in the state of Tennessee. Her accolades are many, including recognition by the Nashville Business Journal and Nashville Post for her business and political acumen. In addition, she's been a PrideNet ambassador for the Pride Study on Precision Medicine out of Sanford University since 2019. Nancy's involved in many other leadership initiatives in the greater Nashville area. Let's chat with her to learn more about why and how she's become so committed to building stronger and more inclusive communities. I'm Sally Hussey, the CEO of 50 Forward, and we elected to launch this podcast because we know older adults have such inspiring stories and wisdom worth sharing. We have now all learned that social connections are critical to our well-being. This podcast is made possible by 50 Forward, the leading resource for adults 50 plus in Middle Tennessee who seek to live longer, more fulfilling lives. You're listening to Squeeze the Day, where we talk to extraordinary people over the age of 50 who are living their best life now. Their stories of a well-lived life are both inspiring and encouraging to all of us as we seek to navigate a meaningful and purpose-driven second chapter in our life. I'm Susan Sizemore, Communications Director for 50 Forward, so let's get started. Nancy, welcome. We're so excited to have you join Squeeze the Day. It's good to be here, Susan. Will you tell us a little bit about your roots in the Nashville community? Uh, roots. We're going to talk a lot about roots, probably. <laughs> <laughs> it's a teaser. The word of the day is roots. I actually moved to Nashville in 1986. I had started a radio and promotion agency marketing company out of college in Texas and I'd made the decision to move to Nashville instead of L.A. or New York because of obvious reasons. It was just a better place to be. So a college friend of mine and I made the trek and I moved here and ran my company out of Nashville as soon as I arrived. So I've been here since 86. Long before the big boom, huh? (laughs) Yes, but I I date before 440. (laughs) And you could get from Bellevue to Antioch in about 12 minutes. So. (laughs) I long for those days. And you were Nashville before Nashville was cool. Well, yeah, I I think probably, Susan, you and I made Nashville cool. (laughs) It's been a journey, and it's really amazing to see how far we've come. I love all the things that you've contributed and didn't quite know your origin. So that's really a, a nice new piece of history for us to add. I want to talk to you a little bit about being a council rep. Many people know that you're a council rep for Metro Nashville, and others may or may not know that you were the first out lesbian in Tennessee elected to serve in a legislative office. Tell us more about that role. Well, the council in Nashville is a large body. We like to call it herding kittens when we're trying to get us all to agree on something. (laughs) And so I was intrigued at becoming a council member in order to achieve some vision just in my area, both of South Madison and North Inglewood. Mm. And I was not too sure whether or not it was the right thing to do. It was known as a pretty conservative part of the city, but I had lived here and that had not been my experience. It was a very diverse, creative class that existed in this area and I wanted to represent it. So I, one of the first things that you do whenever you're going to run for office is you talk to all your friends to try to get them to talk you out of it. (laughs) That did not work. And I fell into the knowledge of an organization called the Victory Fund and the Victory Institute, which helps out folks get elected. And uh, I went to some of their training. Usually when you go to campaign training like that, you leave either saying, okay, I know what to expect. I'm going to do this, or I know what to expect. And there's no way I'm going to do this. I can maybe with this knowledge, help somebody else win. And so I went through that training in 2010 and 
ran for office in 2011. It was 10 years ago, so we were also going through the whole census and they were doing some redistricting and planned, unbeknownst to me, (laughs) that they were going to redistrict prior to the 2011 election. And I had already started the campaign for an open seat of what was then District 4 and it it became District 8. And so I suddenly was running against an incumbent. And when knocking on the doors there in 2011, I moved from the question of, so what does your husband do? (laughs) To kind of deflect and say, well, I'm not married. What does your spouse do? And try to just not answer the question question. Mm -hmm. And then in 2015, of course, in 2011, we lost, but I got 44% of the vote, which was just enough to convince me I should try it again. And so in 2015, when we ran, you had the same question. So what does your husband do? The answer was my spouse and I are not able to get married. What does your spouse do? To try to not avoid the question, but talk about it. If they wanted to talk about it, they could. At some point, people would say, well, tell me more about your partner. And I would say, well, Joan and I met at a women's Bible study here in Nashville. We've been together for whatever many years it was at that point. We're now 33 years together now. Wow. Congrats. <laughs> Thank you. It allowed someone who was not comfortable with the conversation to not answer the conversation, but still get the information, right? But you had to be very strategic about it. Mm. We were able to win that election by nearly 70% of the vote. And wow. then in 2019, when we ran again, got a little over 82% of the vote. And so the question at that time was not, are you married or what does your husband do? But rather, how's Joan doing? Uh, and so that 10 years and those three campaigns kind of tells the progression of Davidson County and its acceptance to out candidates. But for the most part, mm. learning along the way that just running is winning because of the visibility and being able to kind of acknowledge the fact that people are watching that you don't realize are watching that maybe you can influence to mm. also be their complete and whole selves wherever they are. Mm-hmm. That's a great story. Amazing history. And it's nice to see that over time, things are changing or have changed and the questions don't quite come out so pointedly in one respect. I don't know why we as a community or as human beings are kind of wired like that, but it does beg the question of, should I think first before I open my mouth? And, or how should I frame that that's more open and accepting of everyone? Sure. So let's talk a little bit about June and Pride Month because we're heading into Pride Month and I know there's going to be a lot of celebrations and a lot of inclusivity and I wondered what you might be involved in this June. June is always an important time of the month. Community, of course, it celebrates the uprising at Stonewall in 1969. Here in Nashville in 1988, the year that my wife and I met, was the first year that Nashville had its own Pride Festival. So that I feel like I've kind of grown up with that this year because of the heat and trying to plan because of COVID last year, Nashville Pride Festival won't be until September. And so there are a lot of organizations that are continuing the tradition of a lot of different activities during the month of June anyway, which is true and appropriate. But we'll also be able to have another opportunity to celebrate later in the month when it's a little cooler outside. So that'll be good. So I like to look at the June calendar as it relates to what the Nashville LGBT Chamber has in mind. There are different events that are coming up, both virtually and in person, that folks can attend. First thing I do every year for several years is on June the 1st, I replace our flag here at the house with a pride flag. It always flies (laughs) during the month of June. I have an American flag that will replace it again in July. During the month of May, it's been Preds flag <laughs> flying. <laughs> so we're hoping for a success there. But in June, I kind of ceremoniously like to change the flag out for the month. That's really interesting. And I know as I've heard about the changes with this June and wondered how June and September, if they would again become both months in which Pride events were celebrated or if that's just this year, because COVID really has put a pall and a different sort of lens on all of our lives. And you're absolutely right. June can be super, super hot in this part of the country anyway. 
And some folks don't realize that there's been a precedent for Nashville to have its pride in the autumn. We moved it back to June several years ago, but for those of us who've been around a while, it's natural. Oh yeah, okay, we're moving back to the autumn. It's okay. In Atlanta, uh, some folks that just love to go to area prides to be able to go to Atlanta Pride or to go to Chattanooga or do different, uh, different things and still have an opportunity to celebrate here. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Makes great sense. So I want to talk a little bit about your last name. At some point, I had a conversation with you and I said, well, how did you come up with your married last name? And I'd like you to share that story a bit. It's very heartwarming. Sure. I was born, my maiden name, whatever that means these <laughs> days, I don't even know what that means, is Reese, just the Reese, R-E-E-C-E. There is actually another Nancy Reese in Nashville, and so don't confuse us. That was my name growing up. My wife's name was Van Bueller. So we, as I said, got together in 1988 after our 10 years together, got with Abby Rubenfeld and got our paperwork together because we could not marry. So we did a lot of the Mm. legal documentation that may be required. In fact, we had to use it once in a hospital in order for me to visit to have the paperwork ready. Mm. So we did that in 98. And then in 2004, we were not convinced the state of Tennessee was going to allow us to get married anytime soon. So we decided that we would ceremoniously combine our last names and do so in a legal way as a symbol of our relationship. And so we took the van from Van Bueller and the Reese and combined them into the Van Reese. And so mm-hmm. we actually did an internet search and uh, background searches to make sure we weren't stealing somebody else's name or there's was this some like crazy person <laughs> named Van Reese or something we didn't know about. <laughs> and, and we are the only ones. There's some athlete in, I think it's Sweden with the Van Reese, R-E-I-S, that shows up every once in a while in my inbox alert for my name being used. But as far as we can tell, we are the only Van Reese's, which is crazy, right? (laughs) I get a little sensitive if I have to tell you more than once (laughs) that there's no space between the two because that was the whole point was to combine the name, the Van Reese's. And so Abby Rubenfeld helped us with the name change documents and we went to probate (laughs) to get our names changed. And Judge Kennedy was on the bench and and you fill out the paperwork, you pay your $100 because you're going to change your name. And so we did it at the same time on the same day. We just picked a day we were going to do all of it. And we got there, we were just sitting in the courtroom. There's maybe three other people waiting to also do something. And Judge Kennedy looked at our documents. We were back to back and he said, y'all want to do this together? <laughs> so it's like, yeah, yeah. we would have invited people if we known that was going to happen. right? So, <laughs> so we stood in front of the judge and he said, promise that you're not changing your name to avoid bad debt. <laughs> or he's like, you know, it's like, I do. You know, it's like, it's like weird. <laughs> So that was pretty funny. So Uh, we changed our name there in September of 2004 and spent the day getting new driver's license and social security cards and all that jazz. And so the Van Reese's were born in September of 2004. That's fabulous. That is (laughs) quite a story and even a little bit more than I think I heard the first time. How many times do you have to fight people to put an S in place of the C? (laughs) Well, I I grew up with that. Ah, I am not a peanut butter (laughs) cup. I was the Reese, right? Yeah. Van Bueller was also combined. And so she got used to people looking things up under B instead of <laughs> the V. And mm. So I didn't take that away from her. But Van Rees, you still have to spell it usually. You got to spell it right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and put it together. Yes. No space. Exactly. <laughs> Speaking on behalf of 50 Ford, one word with a capital F. Exactly. <laughs> Push together. Yes, I get it. <laughs> You have many things in common with 50 Ford, including the All of Us Research Program. That is a new initiative from the NIH to advance precision medicine. 50 Ford is a national community engagement partner with that program, and you are an ambassador for the All of Us through PrideNet. Will you talk a bit about how you got involved in this effort and why it's important to you? Yeah, I actually became interested in the program through 50 Ford. Kelsey there had asked me to participate in the launch of all of us research. And in doing research on all of us, <laughs> I, I saw that there were different affinity initiatives, if you will, whether it's to seniors, Hispanic, LGBT, Asian, all different types of groups. And I said, you know what, I'd be more than happy to participate in this and talk about it at the launch. But I would like to specifically talk about the importance of research in the LGBTQ community. She said, yes. And so I was part of that launch and 
my speech became a blog post in the folks at PrideNet, the Pride Study out of the University of California and Stanford University. They have another program that has been running longer than all of us research doing uh, similar surveys, direct research regarding LGBTQ health. They kind of became the conduit to all of us, much like 54 became the conduit to seniors. Mm. I was introduced to them through that program. And so I became a PrideNet ambassador, uh, which is one of about a dozen of us or 10 of us for the most part across the country that represent different socioeconomic and race and geographic differences to be able to work as an advisory board to the Pride study. I've been doing that now for three years. In fact, my term with them ends at the end of June. And so I'll be leaving that program, but still acting as a participant. It's been good because I've been able to talk about both Pride Study, the pridestudy.org, as well as the All of Us Research slash LGBT to other electeds. My relationships with the League of Cities and with the Victory Institute, I've been able to talk about the program to other out electeds who then have been able to take information about those programs to their different towns and cities. And so I've really enjoyed kind of being the bridge builder on that, continue to be a participant in both of the studies. It's terrific. I didn't realize that your quote unquote term ended and the bridge builder and connector leads us perfectly into a little bit more about your life and what has kind of made you such a natural connector, but also how does your education play into what you're doing today? Interesting. I don't know if you've heard this story or not, but I'll share it with you. In 1968, I was four years old and I heard a rock thrown through the window of my home growing up in Oklahoma City. And I remember the sound of my mother running down the hallway with a sense of urgency, not of fear, which is weird that I could comprehend the difference at that age, but I, I wasn't frightened, but I knew something was happening. The next day, my dad set my brother and I down. I'm the youngest of four, but the two of us are closer in age. And he set us down to explain what had happened. It was 1968, and my dad had lowered our flag in front of our home to half staff out of respect for the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. And someone had thrown a rock through our window for having done that. So he was trying to explain to his four-year-old and his six-and-a-half-year-old what was going on. Mm. And I comprehended it as much as a four-year-old could, but I do know that it instilled in me, number one, my mother's sense of urgency. And number two, my dad's thoughtfulness in storytelling to explain what would have happened, not ignoring it. But then also in the real determination to take action. And he became involved at that time as 91, going on 92 right now, in great health, by the way. That's great. (laughs) He uh, was an oral surgeon and in Oklahoma City, and one of the very few that would perform extraction of wisdom teeth Mm. on African Americans in the area. They couldn't find a dentist that would do it. So I grew up with that. So when you talk about my education and what my faith life was like and what my family life was like, Mm. that education had much more impact on me than what I did at college. I think that when I look back and I see what I learned, who I learned it from, it's uh, the way in which I've learned (laughs) has always been Mm. story-based. And so I realized that very true concept of how people don't remember what you said, they remember how you made them feel, it is very true in my life. I try to leave things in a way to where it continues to motivate others to go forward. So I went to what was then a high school of performing arts, sort of. They didn't call it that, but basically that's all we did in Oklahoma City. There's now actually a statue of Vince Gill in, in front of my high school in Oklahoma City, which is <laughs> weird. It doesn't actually look like him, but they tried. So, <laughs> so I grew up very arts focused and went to Baylor University because my brothers had gone there. So I went from Oklahoma City to Texas and thought I was going to be a high school drama teacher and ended up going to 
a read at the college radio station to read the news. I thought it was another audition. And so I got there and I did my first rip and read and I read the news and I fell in love with radio. My combination of storytelling, radio and music started from there. So my education in music, music promotion, marketing all kind of came out of real life as opposed to my actual formal education. Well, that's so interesting. And the rock coming through the window at the age of four, I can't even imagine that gave me goosebumps. A life changer, but the way you accept those circumstances, I think really is profound. I want to ask a little bit about your thriving in a social setting. I know you're a lifelong learner. I can see that in some of the things that you've done and then things that I've heard some people say or seen posts about you being a mentor for others. And I'm just wondering about applying your skills in new ways and why that's so important as we age and why that's part of your DNA. I think my life experience is unique in that I was in the closet for a large part of my early adult life. And so Mm. you kind of create barriers, insulation, and then there's a a natural tendency for uh, gay women couples to kind of nest and not really need much socialization in the salad days. But I think that it's been an ongoing journey for me to find a group of friends that the relationship is not transactional. Somebody's not trying to get something done Mm. or ask for a help or to do a thing. It's just a friendship. You just help your friend. It's not about a transaction. And that type of relationships with friends can take a long time to generate. And I know that uh, some people have been able to do that because uh, they have children and they meet other parents and they do things together as families. And then you create these insular sort of groups of social settings because of that. And then you find ways to socialize amongst each other based on circumstances. For gay couples in particular, but even single people, although it's been a long time since I've been single, as gay couples, it's really hard to find safe places that you can go and meet other people in similar life situations, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I've been extremely positive about the intentional effort that 50 Forward is making to create those safe places for people. And so I have great hopes to help continue to encourage people to to show up. When I was a founder of the Nashville LGBT Chamber in 98, (laughs) we had to call ourselves the Nashville Association of Professional Persons because you couldn't put the word gay anywhere in the title or no one would come. Mm. Uh, We met in a room down a hallway at the Lowe's when little markings and you had to close the door whenever the meeting started because you didn't want people walking by and seeing somebody that wasn't out. And so those circumstances, (laughs) I think it sounds crazy, doesn't it? From 1998. I'm not talking about 60 anymore. I was talking about 98. 98. Right. So in Nashville, now the chamber has over 800 members. It's very prominent in our society. I say that because at that time, I was one of the very few female members, and I would have to call people to let them know that I would be there. Just so the other females, just they know that it was a safe place, that there'd be somebody to talk Mm. to. And so I think that that similar situation is going to take place at, at 50 forward centers where you have somebody that it's just comfortable saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to be here. Come on. It's, it's cool. We can hang out. And I think that that's going to help people feel safe and comfortable developing a, a community where all these stories can be shared. Thank you for that. And it is about the acceptance of anyone over the age of 50, regardless of anything else. Just come and find your place, your purpose, and learn, enjoy from one another. And I do think it's a new day, but I think it takes a community and really the support to make that community. So I want to talk a little bit about sports only because you've touched on Preds, and then I've seen that you are a huge fan of basketball and specifically women's basketball. Tell us a bit about your passion for sports in general and then why women's basketball. Well, I grew up playing basketball. It was half court. If there's anybody else out there that's 
a fan of three on three, six, six woman basketball. I'm all ears, but I was a forward. So, mm. you know, you either were a guard and you were on that side of the court or you're a forward. You know, so I got to shoot the ball, right? Uh, someone was teasing me. He said, Nancy, you're still at the half court line saying, give me the ball, give me the ball, give me the ball. You're still there. <laughs> I'm like, it's a good, that's an interesting observation. <laughs> <It's> a, <laughs> so I really, you know, I think team sports is extremely important. We are actually moving toward next June. 2022 being the 50th anniversary of Title IX. I am eager to work with the Nashville Sports Council and uh, Nashville Sports Authority, as well as folks on the Metro Council. I'm going to actually ask the vice mayor, as another ship, I'm going to ask the vice mayor to help me with a committee about the events that'll be taking place next year to celebrate women athletes in general you know, from Wilma Rudolph and everybody. Right. So, Mm -hmm. but basketball was played it. So I enjoy it. And I was an early adapter to the WNBA now in its 25th season, the way in which they've really blossomed this year. If you haven't watched any games, I encourage you Mm. to look for them because they're excellent games. I'm a fan in general, but I think that what happened is that uh, Margaret Bem who is also a very well-known women's sports advocate, saw that I was kind of passionate about women in sports. And she invited me to be part of the advisory council to bring professional women's sports to Nashville. Mm. And so I've been on that advisory council. There's a committee. There's been some excellent research done, uh, amazing consultant work to kind of determine what types of professional women's sports would thrive well and And moving that forward, it's clear that women's soccer, tennis, and basketball would all do very well here. But particularly, I'm hoping that we can get some things together so that ownership would be excited about a WNBA team in Nashville playing at Municipal Auditorium. That's what I would really, really love. Mm. So I'll be doing that. I've got two years left on the council, but I'll be pitching that for as long as 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 they'll let me. Mm. (laughs) <laughs> Those things take a lot of time and even more money. That's been my involvement in trying to actually not just become a fan, but actually bring something to my town. I think it's long past time. We're a sports town and to have no professional women's sports here is just, mm. that's wrong. We should be doing better than that. So yeah. But good for you. So I didn't know that you used to play. That makes all perfect sense now. And I look forward to seeing how that develops. Let's talk a little bit about your four-legged family member and how you came to own Chance. Chance is a red healer collie mix, which means she's beautiful and mm. she knows that. She <laughs> there are friends that call her Maybelline because of her eyeliner, natural eyeliner. She's beautiful. I really am convinced that dogs kind of become whoever their environment allows them to become. Cause they told us like, Oh, it's a healer. She's going to want to play all the time. And when it's like, well, it's a puppy. Yeah. But now she's pretty much, she's under my feet right now. She's pretty much like her mom's just like play, sleep, watch TV, (laughs) repeat. (laughs) So, so, uh, So she's pretty awesome. So she loves long walks, but she just assumed not, uh, at the same time. So she's very much like us. She, we found her, we had a, another dog named Scout that we rescued from a shelter, had her for 14 years. And when she passed, we thought, well, you know, we'll wait a while before we get another dog. But then I made the mistake of going online and searching Red Healer Rescue. Don't do that. By the way, don't, <laughs> don't do that unless you're ready to bring home a dog. I saw her, uh, she was actually being fostered in Alabama and we drove down to the state line and met them and agreed to foster her to kind of see, you know, what she was like and fell in love with her. And she got her at seven months and she's just turned seven years old. So that's nice. I tell her she's seven now and in eight years, I'll be 65. So I keep telling her, I said, you know, you got to get me to 65. (laughs) Ah, ah. So tell us a little bit about your passion for fashion and especially ties. (laughs) <laughs> it's a little trademark there. You know what? That's just hilarious. I wear the same clothes I wore 10 years ago. I need a new wardrobe, <laughs> but I do mix it up a little bit. But it is frightening. You know, when you see those old pictures from your past, you're like, oh my gosh, that's that same shirt I wore yesterday. That's really sad. It's really <laughs> sad. Anyway, <laughs> my friend at the Nashville LGBT Chamber started a company called Clifton and Leopold, the fashion company. 
uh, here based out of Nashville. Beautiful fabrics. And their slogan is, how I do dapper. <laughs> it's a very hmm. a- androgynous. They, but they have uh, neckties, bow ties, pocket protectors, scarves a number of different types of things, but beautiful hmm. fabrics. Right when they opened, I, I got a new tie and I wore it on the council. Everyone was like, oh, you look so cute in the tie. I'm like, oh, okay, okay. I'll just I'll wear some ties. <laughs> then when we were in COVID, I was like, I'll wear a tie on the WebEx calls. So they sent me a free tie, which was like a big deal because they're not cheap. And, and I was like, well, I guess I better wear the tie. <laughs> She's like, what am I, an influencer now? So evidently I am. So I have two or three really great neckties, <laughs> but I'm always looking for them in vintage stores and stuff because they're a little bit narrower. Or, mm. But now I've gone into the habit to wear even just a pretty scarf. I tie like it were a necktie and then uh, and leave it looped up. So yeah, it's just something I like to do. <laughs> so you've got the technique to tie that special kind of knot in a tie. That's a big deal. Yeah, that's that sort of that weird Windsor knot. You know, YouTube taught me how to tie a tie. I got to tell you, I had to keep practice. Now it's muscle memory, but there was several moments where I had to go back to YouTube to remember what to do. (laughs) There's a very special technique. I remember when our son was little going, nobody taught me how to do this. I can figure it out, but I can't make it look as good as somebody else's. Yeah. (laughs) So curious about what you do in your spare time, if you have any. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's funny because, you know, they consider the Metro Council job a part-time job. They don't tell you part-time means half a day, 12 hours. That's (laughs) part-time. Wow. So I do, I just started a new day job and I love it. I'm the new vice president of public affairs and business development for Roots Productions, which is bringing the new Roots Barn, which is under construction, Mm. uh, the forever home of the nationally acclaimed television show Music City Roots, uh, which will be back on PBS. It's Nashville's Austin City Limits, if you will. Mm. And so that's coming back as well as a new program called the Soul Sunday Brunch. And it's the barn is being built right next door to 50 Ford Madison Station and in between them and Amquay Station. And so the whole campus there is going to be a welcoming, beautiful place. So we're building that and I'm working on all the things that I need to do for that. And so with that new job and the council work, there's very, there's not a whole lot of spare time, but Joan and I really do enjoy walks and I I'm a painter still. Uh, I was, before joining Metro Council, a good third of my income was from my artwork. Mm. Uh, I have three paintings at Vanderbilt. I have two at University of Arizona. I have some in Canada and different places across the United States. And at one time, I was selling six to 10 paintings every quarter. And I stopped doing the large format kind of series driven artworks that I used to do whenever I was elected in 2015. And so I, I now still doodle, I watercolor, I keep a, an art journal. And I think that uh, when I leave office in 2023, I'll be able to start having a little bit more brain width to actually realize some of those drawings again and start painting again. But that's what I enjoy quite a bit. That's fabulous. And I know I've seen a piece or two of your artwork in the Madison area. And I think if memory serves me correctly, I know there's not one in my home. So I was always outbid, but I had no idea how much you have done and where they were. So that's awesome. Don't let that skill go to waste. Do you have a mentor or somebody who's influenced your life that really has helped you kind of become the community leader you are today? That's a great question. I don't think that tagged it that way, but Early on, when I spent nine years as a senior licensing executive at BMI, Broadcast Music Incorporated, mm. and there was a man there named Bill Grothy that was in senior management from 1998 to 2007. I would have considered him my mentor in regard to how to use my natural powers of persuasion Mm. to be able to create win-win situations in all negotiation. And I, I, to this day, I credit him for being my educator in regard to how to do that Mm -hmm. and to do it uh, authentically in, in a way that seemed natural to me. Currently, there are a couple of women that I respect a lot. I don't know that they know that they've been mentoring me. Mm. (laughs) Uh, With every action, I have learned from them. And that would be Kim Hawkins from Hawkins Partners Landscape Architecture Mm -hmm. and Margaret Bem, the attorney, Margaret Bem. Uh, Both of them are just beautiful human beings. 
the city that I love called Nashville would not be the city that I love without them having been in it the last 30 years. And so I really learn from them quite a bit. They don't know that. <laughs> Maybe they do. <laughs> well, they will know it now. <laughs> All right. Yeah. No. And those are really Nashville household names if you follow community. And so I'm not surprised, but I am surprised and really nice to, you know, call them out for people. There are probably subtle influences in everyone's lives at some point, but you don't necessarily call that person a mentor unless the opportunity presents itself. So that's pretty cool that you're sharing that. Yeah, it's just, I read Stacey Abrams' book and she, several of them, but, but the one in general in regard to her memoir, there's a part in there talking about, you don't need a, a mentor, you just need to find people that you can collaborate with. And it's hard because there's that traditional sense of finding someone saying, will you be my mentors? <laughs> right. Well, it's like, what is that? It's right. like the work that you have done or the kind of person that you are or the thing that you said influenced me beyond your realization. Mm. So I'd like to find some time to tell you about that. And I think that all relationships, if they're working well, are mentors. Mm -hmm. Brandy Lamb at the Madison Senior Center has done more for me by being who she is and calming me down <laughs> whenever I have way too much going on. I just have to talk to Brandy for a minute and it just lowers my blood pressure. To me, that's a valuable mentor. Absolutely. That's a valuable skill for sure, especially in someone in a position that can be a hot seat often. We ask a question of most of our podcast guests that is really relating to advice that you might have received from an older parent or a mentor or an older adult that at the time you might have thought, this just makes no sense. It's never going to be relevant, but that it really rings true to you every day in your life now. I was very fortunate to have both a mother and a father who were mentors to a lot of different people. And so I was able to kind of watch them and the ways in which they give advice. But my mother died in 2014 at the age of 80. She had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, had gotten through it, mm. and then all of a sudden it just came back. So it was a bit of a surprise, but a really difficult year. I was 50 and she was 80. Mm. It was a little bit of a wake-up call <laughs> when you say, well, if I only have 30 years left, what am I doing with them? Right. Mm. So I asked my mom that at that time. And I said, what's your advice? What's the important things? You know, other than what you've taught us that you don't invest money, you invest in people mm. <laughs> and where your money goes is the people. What else? And she said, Nancy, do something today that will matter tomorrow. Mm. And then all of your tomorrows will matter. Oh, you should put that on a T-shirt. Beautiful. Uh, every day I'm like, what did I do today that's going to matter tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And if you've got something that you can say, yeah, that's going to matter. Particularly if you don't have children, you can't see the legacy as clearly as if you have children. And so that was extremely helpful to me. Nice. So I have one last question. That is, what is it Nancy Van Reese does to squeeze the day? Well, there's a technical answer, which is organization. <laughs> <laughs> I really try to make sure that in every week I have designated time to do nothing. And that helps me fuel the rest of my week. And it's really hard sometimes to really protect that time. I am particularly thrilled now that 50 Forward is opening up again, because I'll <laughs> be able to, to go over and, and spend a little bit of just Nancy time over in the Janet Jernigan room and do a little workout, just kind of walk around and not be asked questions about potholes somewhere. Mm. <laughs> I would love that, you know, that kind of thing. I'm looking forward to that facility being part of my, my squeezing of every day. My relationship with my wife, Joan, we've learned that we have to help each other stop every day and remind each other what's really important. That's the way that I, I'm able to squeeze it. Very good. So I want to thank you for joining us today. I think there are so many things that you've not only shared that demonstrate your amazing life of leadership, but also I think your stories will inspire others. Thanks so much for being part of our podcast. I appreciate it, Susan. Now we challenge everyone listening to go squeeze the day. 